we are now going to invite Max and Johannes to come on, who are our guests for the next part. And this actually is part of our course. It's um, you are talking to University of Princeton and Columbia University students. There are 10 of them and they've just given their presentations as you've just heard. But we also have, in addition, about 36, it's 35 now um, participants, Kenyans from across the country, people from other countries who have tuned in to listen to this presentation. Max, you gave us a very juicy title <laughs> for this presentation. I've known Max for some time, but I've known Johannes even longer because of his amazing work on great apes through the United Nations. So welcome, Max and Johannes. The floor is yours. Right. I'm trying to figure out how to share a screen here. So if you bear with me for one second. Right. I believe we've got this screen, right? Yep. OK, good, good. So. Paula, let me start by thanking you for inviting us to these very interesting and very insightful ideas. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been speaking. You know, I thought, you know, I thought we, this was going to be one of those discussions, but I got glued to it. So I feel very pri privileged to have been invited to listen to some of the work that you're doing. I think there's a bright future there, so well done. Dino, I was also listening to your comments at the end and I thought, well, that's a great point about being science-led. Or to put it in other words, it's, uh, you're making a great point about ensuring that our politics is informed by science. And tonight, I'm hoping that we'll have a conversation about one of the most highly political uh, um, tragedies in a way, but uh, also... Uh, um, events that is that, that we are currently going through. That's the COVID-19 crisis. My dad used to say that um, there are lots of inequalities in this world, but the only contest in which we are equal is in the contest for ideas. So I'm really glad that you've organized this. As Paula said, my name is Maxwell Gomera. I'm joining you guys from Cambridge in the UK. I am from Zimbabwe, in case you're wondering where this accent is from. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking to you guys. You know, Princeton University is one of those that I've been following, and uh, I was hoping to be a student at some point. I wasn't able to, but it's fantastic that I'm able to speak to people who are at Princeton today. I'll be joined, uh, I'll be delivering this uh, talk with uh, my colleague, Johannes. Johannes is one of the, um, people that I have known who have actual on the ground experience with uh, zoonotic diseases, as he leads some of our work on great apes. And he has, uh, has published and worked with people who, who have a lot of uh, knowledge on Ebola, which is one of those uh, diseases. And I've asked him today to join me uh, to have this conversation with you. We are hoping that this will take no more than 30 minutes, our talk that is. And we would like to go with you through what we know about zoonotic diseases, COVID-19 and the environment. What we need to learn, COVID-19 itself, we will go a little bit into that and other zoonotic diseases and some of the policy responses that are beginning to emerge. Now, this is where we'll spend a lot of time because we would like to share with you some ideas of what we are seeing in the conversations that are going on in the literature around the world and start to get some thinking going about how we collectively can start to influence what's going on with, uh, with uh, the COVID-19 responses. To get us going, um, I'll let uh, um, my colleague Johannes take us through some of the more sciencey bits of what we know and what we need to learn. Then I'll come back and join you in a discussion about some of the policy responses. Johannes? Yeah, thank, thank you, Max. And next slide, please. Um, thanks, Paola, for inviting us. Hi to, hi to Dino. Um, yeah, I'm a trained ecologist. I spent working the field in Uganda, East India, Congo, and in Ivory Coast for most of my time. 
Um, but I have to admit that I'm, uh, I'm an ecologist and not an epidemiologist, but I have been working on disease-related questions. But let me start with a little anecdote because I'm really convinced ecologist, I, and I believe that ecology is the answer to many questions. But one of the very famous Ebola researchers who cited all every day told me, Johannes, you're studying the wrong thing. The things you don't see, they're going to hold the world's breath. Unfortunately, the guy was right. Now, basically, COVID has stopped us from traveling and from doing a lot of the work we are used to do. So let me start with um, zoonotic diseases. What do we know? So zoonotic diseases, these are diseases that are shared by humans and animals. 60% of all known infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic. 75% of all emerging diseases are thought to be zoonotic. It sounds, the numbers sound, go back please, the numbers sound very high, but actually what it means is that we have co-evolved with pathogens or pathogens have co-evolved with their host for millions of years. So for me, it's not really surprising. And if we take the example of the great apes, and I'm actually leading the Secretariat for the Conservation of Great Apes, which is hosted by UNEP and UNESCO. So if you look at the great apes, our close relatives, they can contract diseases from humans, but we can also transmit diseases to them. And there are a few examples. If we go to Ebola, human hunters in the Congo basin consumed meat from gorilla carcasses infected by Ebola and contracted the disease. They were not targeting great apes, they were not hunting great apes, but they found the carcasses on the forest floor and opportunistically used the meat or consumed the meat. Another example, HIV-1 and HIV-2. We all know AIDS, but we probably don't know where it comes from. Actually, HIV-1 comes from chimpanzees in Central Africa and six separate incidences where the virus spilled over to humans have been documented. For HIV-2, it's from Mangabees in West Africa, but we could only document one case where the virus spilled over to humans. Just to give you another example, human T-cell lymphotrophic virus um, infections have been documented for Central African hunters, but not for the human population, which had no co direct contact with, um, with primates. Next slide, please. So yeah, Ebola is a big topic. And uh, the partners in GRASP, of course, they expected answers from us as a secretariat. So in 2016, we liaised with one of the Ebola researchers, Dief Einar Lenders, and she published a scientific review on Ebola and great apes, current knowledge, possibilities for vaccination, and implication for conservation and human health. So that um, scientific review forms the basis of a much shorter grass brochure for Ebola and great, ape, great apes, which was specifically targeted towards the great ape range states. So Ebola, it's a hemorrhagic fever that affects both humans and great apes. And actually in gorillas, we have, um, we have documented a mortality rate up to 95%. So what does that mean? I mean, as you can imagine, um, gorillas have a very slow reproduction cycle and it has been calculated it would take 130 years for those um, populations hit worse by Ebola to recover, 130 years. Another interesting element, you all remember this disastrous Ebola outbreak in West Africa with probably an estimated 17,000 people killed but that entire crisis or Ebola outbreak could be traced back to a little boy in a village in Guinea who got in contact with bats and got infected. Next slide. So today we also want to, to talk about COVID-19 because that's actually the, the crisis which keeps us all home. And Dean was said already that there are no foreign visitors or scientists at the research station right now. So coronavirus, disease 2019, in short, COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus to SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, SARS so the virus is primarily spread between people during close contact through small droplets produced by coughing, sneezing, or simply talking. You probably have heard all this before. What you probably don't know, where does it come from? And while the exact transmission pathways of the current 
COVID-2 are still being un, um, uncovered, the most likely, the most likely source or better reservoir of the virus um, are bats. And when I say a reservoir, that means that the um, environmental conditions or the, the host where the, uh, where the virus or pathogen can survive for a long period of time. But it doesn't mean we know how it gets to humans. So numerous animal species have been speculated as a potential host, uh, as, a, as, as potential vectors which transmitted the disease to humans. So in earlier, in earlier publication, it was the rodents and rats, most, most recently pangolins, and there was a new theory coming up over the weekend. And one of the very famous virologists um, suggested we have to look at civet cats and uh, raccoon dogs because there's an industrial scale um, farming of raccoon dogs and, um, and civet cats in, in China. There's also speculation that an animal intermediary spread the virus through wet markets with live animals in China. That's also a bit controversial because other research groups believe that the virus spilled over to humans somewhere else, but then the market just um, fa facilitates the spread of the disease, almost like an amplifier. Next um, slide, please. So I think we also need to look into zoonotic disease and the development. Um, Africa finds itself at a time where there's rapid, where there's a rapid transformation on the continent. Uh, Bill Lawrence from Australia published a paper in 2015, and he described 33 new development corridors are planned in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, the, those infrastructure corridors, they're opening up entirely new landscapes. This has many potentially negative consequences for the environment. One, obviously, as a byproduct, we see an increase in illegal trade in body parts and live animals. And as we know, in some cases, there's a link to disease, disease transmission. Next slide. So we, we also try to understand what is really the link between a zoonotic disease and the environment. environment. So where biodiversity is high, infection rates for zoonotic diseases can be lower. And there are a couple of documented um, cases. So as an example, the West Nile virus or Lyme disease and rodent-borne hemorrhagic fever. There's also evidence in multiple ecosystems showing increased transmission of flea-borne diseases through small mammals due to anthropogenic disturbance of habitats. But what is the explanation for this? So one potential explanation is that disease transmitting vectors in highly biodiverse areas feed on a larger variety of hosts, which are often thought to be poor reservoirs for the pathogen or of the pathogen. Next slide. There's also evidence of increased prevalence from mosquito-borne disease in Australian tropics tied to land use changes. And the study of zoonotic malaria transmitted by macaques in Malaysian Borneo confirmed the link between zoonotic spillover and deforestation. But it also showed the complex and very different effects of forest degradation at different scales. So maybe we need to look at another, an additional explanation. And it has been proposed that fragmented habitats may stimulate more rapid evolutionary processes and diversification of diseases. We call this the evolutionary hypothesis. Next slide. So it's, it's, it's surprising. I mean, we have seen 25 years of heavy investment in Ebola research. We still don't know the reservoir for Ebola. We know bats are transmitting it to humans. But where does it come from? In case of SARS-CoV-2, we know the reservoir, bats, but not the vector. We need to understand the mechanisms behind the emergence and spread of diseases. And I believe effective monitoring disease in intact ecosystems that are home to priority wildlife species required to establish baselines. And what that means is usually we come and start disease monitoring when it's too late. We have a crisis. 
but we don't know the baseline. And we really suggest that we need to accompany the entire process of habitat alteration with a health monitoring program. Next slide. Good. So and I hand over and I head over to Max, of course. <laughs> thank you. Um, that was very good. What I, what we wanted to do with uh, uh, Johannes' discussion was to establish the the science and uh, what we know and what we still have to understand, so you could get a sense of some of the difficulties that policymakers tend to face when they are trying to regulate under such crisis. So. One of the, over the next 15 minutes, we're going to spend some time looking at some of the challenges that policymakers are facing and to begin to think about how we can help um, as uh, students who are looking at this, but also as a community of practice and try to help them understand and answer the question, what would be correct and effective policy response to COVID-19 and other diseases that arise. Now, with regards to COVID-19, much of the broad policy focus so far has been around reducing the probability of transmission from one person to another. And what we have seen are public health measures such as social distancing, such as washing hands, you know, those kinds of emergency responses that governments have tended to promote in order to respond to the public health um, crisis that COVID-19 has caused. But this needs to go a little bit further. We need to go to the core of why, where did this come from? And how do we, how do humans first interact with the dangerous pathogens that are causing us a problem in the first place? Well, I'll propose that there are three ways in which humans tend to interact with these dangerous pathogens and how they tend to come to our dinner tables. The first one is that we eat or trade body parts of wild animals. A good understanding of how we get into interaction with these things will help us to shape the policy responses. So first, we eat and trade body parts of wild animals. Second, we tend to capture and mix them with wild species to trade them in markets. And third, of course, as Johannes has uh, explained, we tend to destroy habitats. And by destroying habitats, we are destroying the buffers that we have, but also uh, you know, losing some of the dilution effect that would happen when we have very intact habitats. Now, understanding these three, uh, there have been a few policy measures that are currently in discussion. Yeah, last week, the World Health Organization uh, started to respond to one of the biggest issues that policymakers are beginning to pay attention to. How do we regulate wildlife wet markets? Now, wildlife wet markets are those markets that uh, sell um, fresh vegetables and fruits, they sell fresh meat, sometimes they do bring um, uh, live animals uh, and they are slaughtered or upon request by customers. In other words, wet markets are available and are almost everywhere around the world. But the ones that we are talking about right now are those wet markets that also bring uh, wildlife to, to consumers. And those are the ones that uh, policy attention is currently focused at uh, monitoring and regulating. The World Health Organization proposed that we need to strengthen the sanitary conditions to ensure that these markets meet the same standards as any other market for human handling and consumption of food. But there are other opinions that are beginning to arise and governments are beginning to consider how we put them into place. They are more, these are more prescriptive measures, such as not allowing trade in primates or bats, i.e not bringing them to markets. Second, not bringing wild mammals to markets. And this is being also discussed um, as a measure that we could take for added safety and on welfare grounds. Third, continuing to start how viral pandemics arise and prepare for them globally. 
Now, Dino, you were talking about some of the work that uh, President Obama had put in place, which had been put on hold. And now the good news is that we are again going to invest in such measures. I know that in Kenya, a lot of scientists, the Kenyan government has invested in enabling a lot of scientists to begin to generate new knowledge to help us understand what is happening. And around the world, many governments are beginning to invest in that. And the private sector as well, and many universities are beginning to it. That is an important step in helping us to understand how to regulate better. Another area that has also come under scrutiny and where we are beginning to see countries making at least some regulatory overtures is around wildlife trade and trade bans. Now, as things currently stand, domestic trade is regulated by sovereign states. So any trade in wildlife, you know, whether that be you know, bushmeat trade, whether that be any other exchange of wildlife uh, within national jurisdictions, that is regulated by states. But international trade, especially, or perhaps exclusively, <laughs> in species considered endangered, is regulated by the Conference of the Parties of uh, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Now, there is a big debate out there on which is best, regulating trade or prohibiting trade. Should we be putting trade bans in place? And when we put trade bans in place, where are we going to be putting these trade bans? And uh, on, on what uh, sort of species are we going to be putting trade bans on? Remember what we talked about on wet markets. Um, um, fish is also traded in wet markets. Are we going to be stopping the trading, uh, to be banning the trade of fish or any other species that uh, humans rely upon? I just remember that um, uh, Paula asked me where the wet, uh, wet market comes from. Now, my understanding is that at these markets, you know, because of the fresh food, people also tend to put the food in ice. And a long time ago, you know, the ice tends to melt and this becomes wet and they became known as wet markets. But also we must understand that they do sell fresh food. So there could be some relationship to that. But as things currently stand, global policy opinion is in favor of legal, regulated, sustainable and traceable trade in wildlife. But that doesn't mean that this is something that is going to, to be there forever. I think that people are beginning to have a rethink in light of COVID-19 about where else we need to be cautious. For example, China has suspended wildlife trade. So those are issues that um, uh, we're beginning to be confronted with. The important point is that if a trade ban is going to be implemented, it must be informed by science, as, uh, as Dino said. Another area that is also coming under scrutiny is the area of sustainable use of wildlife. And the issues that are beginning to be discussed there are around when is use of wildlife sustainable? And in much of the literature, a few areas are becoming very clear that we need to be focusing on and we need to be contributing to them. One is wildlife use is sustainable when it is ecologically sustainable when there is evidence that uh, its use will not threaten the long-term survival of a species. But that's not all. It is sustainable when there's a defined benefit stream. There must be some benefit that we get from this. But also when there are defined beneficiaries, one of the most uh, sustained criticism against uh, sustainable use has been that much of the benefits are not going to poor communities who live with wildlife or with forests. And indeed, you know, that, that, that is probably, that is true. If, uh, if benefits don't flow to the right people, then they will not find any reason to be able to maintain wildlife. So we need to be making sure that there's a defined benefit stream and there are defined beneficiaries who are seeing wildlife as important to maintain. But then there's also an animal rights and animal welfare um, argument that is, that is coming into, into place. And the, 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 the animal rights and animal welfare argument has 
there's you know, many, many complexities to it. But at its core, it's about whether or not human beings have got the right to use uh, wildlife for their, for their benefit. Um, and then there are other you know, um, arguments that come in uh, in, that, in that regard. So I thought we could spend some time as well understanding some of the policy challenges that policymakers are facing at this stage when they are trying to regulate on, uh, on uh, COVID-19. One of them is defining the scope of the problem. And as I said at the beginning, while at this stage, policy attention is focused on reducing the probability of transmission, is that the sum total of the problem that we are facing? When we reduce, when we reduce the, the, the probability of transmission, have we actually made the world safer from uh, zoonotic diseases? Well, the answer has to be no, uh, because there are other underlying causes that we need to, to, to be addressing. But there are also other political economy problems that we need to be addressing. For example, you could be in a country like uh, Zimbabwe, you could be in a country like Kenya, where if you were to propose social distancing, some members of the society will be able to adhere to those measures, but there are others for whom space is a problem and they will not be able to adhere to those measures or to have fresh water, to, uh, clean water to be able to wash their hands. So those are some of the political economy problems that we need to deal with as we move forward. And as we regulate, uh, we need to be thinking about how do we address those problems. Another challenge is around enforcement measures. There are some wise person once said to me, um, you must not threaten to do something unless you intend to do it. You mustn't, I've got a son and a daughter here, um, and uh, you know, I never threaten to do something to them that I don't intend to carry out. The reason being, if you are a policymaker, you cannot be threatening to, to, to do something that you cannot enforce. So policymakers are now grappling with how do we come up with measures that are not just sensible measures, but are enforceable. For example, um, the consumption of, uh, of um, bushmeat is very prevalent in, in most parts of uh, West and Central Africa. By some estimates, about 75% of people in, in, in those countries have at some point or do consume um, uh, meat from, from, from wildlife. And if we were to suddenly say, you cannot do this, then we create problems for ourselves because that will tend to go underground. So we've got to find a measure that we can enforce and will not create other unintended consequences. And that brings me to another problem that policymakers are having to grapple with, and that's the institutions that we use for ensuring that whatever policy measures we put in place, they are enforceable and they do address the scope of the problem. Now, if you are in a country like Kenya, again, most of the issues that you would have to consider is around the ability of the state to be able to manage, monitor, and regulate some of these issues that we're talking about. But on a more global level, and this is where um, COVID becomes very interesting because it has shown us that it is a global problem. Um, on a more global problem, we need, because it is global, it needs to be managed or at least monitored by an institution that has jurisdiction over a wider geographical area. And this is why we have institutions such as the United Nations, the World Health Organization, UN Environment, the institution that I work for. Um, these were institutions that were designed to help us respond to some of the problems that arise um, at a global level. Now, what has happened in the, very, in the recent past is that politics has become so localized, but the impacts of such politics have become globalized and our economics have also become globalized. And this is a problem that we are now facing. Um, how do we regulate the impacts 
of political decisions that are taken within a, taken within a national jurisdiction, but whose impacts are felt across or beyond those jurisdictions. This is why we need institutions that do have this mandate to be further strengthened and given some of the authority that they need to be able to do that. The last one there that uh, we're having to deal with, and this is the, the elephant in the room, is the whole issue of our measures of well-being. Now, our measure of well-being, of how well we're doing as a society, is uh, frequently uh, growth in our gross domestic product, GDP. But that is proven time and time to be an inadequate measure. For example, just to give you an example, if you have a car accident today, that will register and you take your car for repairs. Because you're going to have to pay money, it's going to register as income and GDP is going to go up. Or, God forbid, if you are unwell and you go to hospital, because you're going to have to pay money and you're going to be contributing to income exchange, GDP will go up. Or if we have a tsunami tomorrow, <laughs> or if we cut down all the forests, the mouth forest, and sell all the wood, yeah, GDP will go up. What happens after that? It doesn't take that into account. Now, this is what has enabled human beings to behave in such a way that we tend to mine what is left of nature and don't, don't, don't put in place or don't get the signals that, that what we are doing is going to result in problems like the one that we're dealing with at the moment. So the time is right to be thinking about what are those measures of success, of, of well-being that we need to be thinking about. Particularly at this stage, we are looking to our families, to our social networks, and to nature for solace and for solutions. Yet those are the two forms of capital, if you like, that GDP doesn't take into account. So before I end this, I want to leave you with some four ideas of areas where I think we need to spend some time thinking and, um, and uh, contributing to the body of knowledge to enable better regulation. I called it our entry. The first one is around habitat loss and destruction. We do know that habitat loss and destruction is one of those big areas that is causing a lot of problems with our zoonotic challenges. And the question there is, how do we take, how do we enable uh, our corporates to take into account some of the biodiversity risks uh, that are attendant when, when we go out to do our economic activity? So if you are Apple, the company, and you go into the DRC to mine Colton, which we all need to enable us to communicate with our mobile phones, how do we ensure that in the process of mining uh, Colton, Apple does not do anything that will result in those biodiversity risks, like the risk of putting us into dangerous contact with uh, pathogens or reducing wildlife habitats does not happen. The same tragedy is happening in the Amazon, you know, it's happening everywhere, you know, in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, we are destroying habitats. How do we reduce that? The second one is around what I call industrial agriculture. Now, when I call it industrial agriculture, it's probably sanitizing it a little bit. But this is a practice that, you know, is most prevalent in North America and in Western Europe, where the production and beef and, uh, you know, livestock has been industrialized on smaller farms where animals are kept in very confined spaces, fed and sent to the market. Now, the problem with that is you know, when animals are kept in confined spaces like that, the probability of, uh, of uh, disease transmission becomes high. And in those areas, we are using a lot of antibiotics, the same antibiotics that we use with humans. And what is tending to happen is that antimicrobial resistance is increasing. And that is becoming another source of diseases that we should be worrying about. The third one is around uh, how do we make wildlife a, 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 an effective and legitimate land use option? Now, if you are in Africa, just about any protected area that you come across in wild Africa, there's a challenge on it of one sort or the other. That's because of the way 
protected areas were established in Africa with forced removals of people. The issue has to be, we all benefit as a global community from the existence of protected areas. So how do we make sure that me sitting in Cambridge here or you sitting in, uh, in New Jersey or, or Seattle or wherever you might be, are also participating in the cost of maintaining a Tavo National Park, um, Amboseli National Park, or any other national park in the world, Kruger, Gonarejo in Zimbabwe, or any other national park. It cannot be that we are just letting poor people bear the costs of existing with, uh, with wildlife and with the protected areas, and the rest of the world is enjoying the benefits of uh, existing with, uh, with uh, protected areas. That is exactly why protected areas are often looked upon and challenged as uh, illegitimate. But also, we need to look into developing tourism and uh, you know, other forms of enterprise that make wildlife an effective land use option. Finally, we need to fix our multilateral system. And as I said, most of the problems that we are facing right now have gone global. You know, we, 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 we create them in our national spaces, but their impacts are global. Yet our ability to respond to them needs to be strengthened. So how do we make sure that our multilateral systems are fit for purpose? Um, and they've got the, the strength that they need to be able to respond. Thank you very much. Let me leave it there. Paula, back to you. Wow, well, thank you guys so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I think this is a, a topic that can keep us going for days and days. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I can see we still have uh, a lot of people on the line. I'm really keen to hear what concerns people have. And I wanted to ask you both, um, you know, recently there were some really troubling videos that we saw uh, regarding in Rwanda, the government trying to eliminate bats from the capital city, Kigali, uh, using chemical sprays on trees to kill uh, one of the, the fruit bats. And we've heard similar things when there was Ebola and there was talk about bats um, being the cause of Ebola. And I wondered if this has ever come into your thinking about how, um, you know, we, we're pitting wildlife against humans. And for some people, the solution therefore is eliminate those animals to protect the people. And I, I wonder how, how do you deal with this as United Nations? How do you make sure that we don't end up actually aggravating the situation through these uh, kind of, in my, in my opinion, a little bit irrational responses? Yeah, thanks Paula, that's a very good question. I'm not familiar with that particular incident and, uh, and, and so I, I couldn't comment on the details of that. But what I could say in general is that, you know, in a time of crisis like this, we've got two very important weapons that we must, uh, we must uh, fall back on. The first one is uh, the quality of information that we've got, the science behind it and how we share it. It is very important that each one of us, you know, plays a role in ensuring that whatever information you're sharing on social media or any other is verified and is backed up by science. So, you know, I'll let, um, um, Johannes comment on whether or not, you know, the, the impact that it's having on bats and why bats are being targeted. But it's very important that we share the right information. I don't think that we should be, we should be targeting bats as if they are the problem here. One point that uh, we, we, I wanted to mention is that, you know, we must also keep at the back of our mind that, yes, we do get diseases from wildlife, but we also give wildlife diseases. And if you look at, uh, COVID-19, it was only a few weeks ago when we heard the news that in America, somewhere in a zoo, uh, human beings had passed on COVID-19 to, to, to animals in a zoo. So that's important. The second point maybe, about each other. Maybe before, um, Johannes, before you respond, I just want to reframe the question just to, to make it a bit. So, so, so um, is, the, is the UNEP 
or any agency within the United Nations putting out uh, messages to countries around the world um, about this ecological aspect that you've spoken so well about. Because I think that this is one of the most difficult things to grasp, that, that destroying habitats makes us more vulnerable. How are we translating it from the science to common public knowledge and even to the communities on the ground so that people really comprehend just the same way as you don't put your toilet next to the river because you're going to poison the water or next to the well, you're going to poison your water. It's like common knowledge now, but it's, but it's a little bit of science has been turned into local knowledge. How do we do this around this issue of um, coronavirus or Ebola and protection of the environment, as well as the species that we actually, uh, maybe we know or we believe may be the cause of these diseases? Yeah, well, th thank you. I mean, and you're absolutely right. This information has to mean something to, to everybody and to the common person in the, in the street. So if you're not doing it already, I would suggest you follow our executive director, Inga Anderson, on, on, um, on uh, Twitter, because what she's doing is she is sharing most of that information exactly. And, and on our website, we are sharing with, with, with the public uh, some of the information that is critical to understanding some of these interactions, but also we are having conversations with governments around some of the policy spaces that governments need to be looking at. Uh, so yes, that is happening, clearly. If you're not already doing it, as I said, do follow Inga Anderson and do follow our website as well for some of the information. Okay. Johannes, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, uh, first is, I mean, uh, we can learn a little bit from the Ebola crisis. And in the case of Ebola, yes, we know, um, we obviously know the vectors, these are bad, but we don't, don't know the reservoir. So even in a theoretical scenario, you would remove all the bats, the disease would still be there. It might be um, transmitted to us through other ways, but the disease would still be there. And I think that was something which was communicated during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. But it's true, yeah, Rwanda had that, um, took that decision and there were a few examples in Asia too, to eliminate bats and we were not happy with that. So second question was, okay, what is UNEP doing? So uh, there were, I think about 15 or something news pieces where we were involved. A lot was picked up in, uh, in The Guardian, but also in other, in other um, journals. And I think we have tried to strengthen that link between um, the outbreak or, of zoonotic disease and the environment. And um, we're actually working on an update of a, of a chapter in the Frontiers Report. So in 2016, UNEP and IRWI launched the um, Frontiers Report with a specific um, chapter on zoonotic diseases. And we decided now with a COVID-19 crisis, let's do an update and strengthen that angle of the environment. And hopefully, I mean, I'm one of the um, co-authors and hopefully we will get the updated chapter out in June. So we have t quite some time pressure to get it out soon. And I, I believe it's important and it's, it will be written in a way that the larger public can understand. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to um, invite John Kissimir, who is involved in a lot of the communications around coronavirus here in Kenya. Uh, he made a comment and I would love uh, to, to have him speak directly to you about his, what he's observing. Hi, John, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, um, the last um, one year I was dealing with Ebola, um, and this year I got myself in Kenya again doing um, this COVID thing. And I did like uh, the comment about the quality of information that needs to be shared. And um, I think the next level for that is how do we engage communities and authorities to translate that information into action? And that's all really, really the challenge we're having. Uh, we had part of the why Ebola took so long uh, was because just to translate that information for people to understand what it is and how to protect themselves versus cultural issues versus religious issues. Um, and we feel the same, see the same thing in Kenya, um, the issue of all the rumors and myths around uh, COVID uh, versus what is really true is really where we either win the battle or we lose it. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, 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 I really, really agree on that. Really, we need to have quality information so that we can engage communities and authorities. Thank you. 
So I think we need a lot more collaboration, probably actually between uh, the team that John is working with on the communications and you guys. What What is interesting, um, I was on two panel discussions last week on um, COVID-19 oh, and, uh, and primates, and we had a lot of um, colleagues from Central and West Africa on the call. And, and one of the things we learned, I mean, the Ebola crisis was terrible in West Africa. Um, and it took a long time, but now it seems um, at least some of the epidemiologists on the call said, obviously the Ebola countries are better prepared to handle, to handle COVID-19 because people are used to keep social distance. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's really interesting. Absolutely. Dianas, I agree with that. It's absolutely, and when, when you see how DRC is uh, Congress uh, addressing COVID-19, they literally translated uh, the same capacity they built for Ebola into how to address COVID-19, the same, same capacity that was built. And I think you're going to see all that across probably West Africa, they're going to do very well. Uh, parts of East Africa, Uganda, if you look at the the curve for Uganda right now is very, very stable because they took the same capacity that they built, the social distancing, the, the screening processes, the point of entry controls, they're doing very well. Um, some level of the same in Kenya. So we, when you look at the modeling that we've been seeing in the last month and the numbers that we have now, you actually said that they're pretty stable because of what the capacity that they've built in the last few years in preparation for Ebola. So absolutely, you, when people are surprised why Africa is not being hit as badly as it is now, partly that could be that could be the reason. Very interesting. Great, thank you for that, John. Really appreciate it. So we have a, a comment and a question from Frederick Onyancha. So I'm just going to allow him to talk now. Frederick, are you there? Okay, it doesn't seem to be, for some reason, it's not responding. I can't unmute him. Okay, this was his comment. Uh, Max and Joe, your study is fascinating. My interest is on habitat destruction. One, do you think that shrinking of wildlife habitats is pushing wild animals to human dominated environments, thus intensifying interactions? And two, can you share your presentation, please? Right. Um, Go ahead. First one, on the first one, uh, actually, I would say, you know what? Uh, humans are encroaching into wildlife uh, habitats. Just to give you a statistic that, that might interest you, last year there was a report that came out that indicated that, you know, we were destroying habitats at the rate of one football field per minute. Just think about it. You know, just from the time when we started making this presentation, we would already have destroyed over 45 football fields. Now that is function, yeah? Um, so humans are doing that and we are encroaching into it. And as we do so, we are, we are first coming into very dangerous conflict with wildlife, but also coming into dangerous contact with disease causing uh, pathogens. Um, and, you know, Johannes, you might have some examples of that from your work with uh, Ebola. Um, can we share the presentation? Yes, of course, we'll send it to you, Paula, and, uh, and uh, you can share. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I think there are four, four um, elements which play into our which contribute to this effect. I mean, yes, when habitat is lost, some animals end up in more anthropogenically um, distur disturbed or modified landscapes. Um, what we often forget is, I mean, we still have a massive human population growth. So even statistically, um, just because we are becoming so many, statistically, we have more encounters with wildlife and also with pathogens. Then obviously um, more humans need more space. So we basically develop more areas and go deeper and deeper into the forest. So we bring in new diseases to local people who have never been exposed to those diseases and vice versa. We also get confronted with those diseases. And, um, and finally, um, we have seen that in the COVID-19 crisis, we, we move goods all around the planet. We move people all around the planet. So an outbreak in China has within weeks 
obviously an impact on the rest of the world. And I think these four elements are, are really important. And if I could go back to Ebola, because Ebola is such, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a disastrous disease, but there are a few things we can learn. And when it was discovered in the, um, in the, in the former Zaire in 1976, um, maybe it has been there even much longer. It often um, erupted in remote villages, people died, nobody knew what it was. So we probably have seen many more Ebola outbreaks, but nobody really knew. It was far away from civilization, nobody took note of it. But now in the modern world, people travel all around and West Africa is very different from Central Africa because we have a long history of human migration. These countries have very close economic links. So with that little outbreak, with that outbreak in um, Guinea, within weeks, it was all over West Africa. So um, yeah, human travel, population growth, habitat um, alterations, these all are very important elements and contribute to the crisis. Right. Well, I want to say thank you, both of you. I'm, I want to appreciate everybody who stayed on the line with us. It's been three hours of fascinating presentations. Could all the Princeton students um, put your videos up again so that we can say thank you to you all? <laughs> I hope that you guys have enjoyed the presentation by Max and Johannes, who uh, did this especially for the Princeton class, and I'm so thrilled that we could do it with a, with a larger audience as well. So thank you, Max. Thank you, Johannes. Really, really appreciate your presentation. Um, this video will be made public. And to the students, unbelievable, uh, well done, all of you. I really loved hearing this out of the box thinking, uh, getting surprised by innovative ideas, fearlessness, um, challenging the, the status quo. I think it's uh, really wonderful to hear those fresh ideas because from what I've heard from people and people have been sending me messages to my inbox and everywhere saying, wow, these kids are amazing. And, and they don't really appreciate you guys have only been doing this course for two weeks so far. So congratulations and, and well done. Matt, thank you for being a star for helping out uh, with everything. Um, and I'm gonna say good night to everyone. And uh, we will be reconvening. I think we're gonna start having regular meetings like this, Max, I need your help and you, Johannes as well. Let's start doing regular meetings. Maybe we won't have our scientific conference for a while, but what stops us from having regular scientific conversations as scientists in Africa and with the rest of the world to trigger and catalyze thinking, new ideas, and new, more research on these issues? So thanks, everyone, and good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.